Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater, and we're so fortunate today to be joined by Lena Hall to talk all about the latest season of Snowpiercer and everything that's going on with her character right now. And, and actually, I wanted to start by diving back to when you first came onto the show, and in particular with the music, music performances, because the story that you're telling now through music and performances on stage is so different to the initial setup, those early stages and those early songs, it was very much about who is this character on the surface? And now we're really getting a different opportunity to go beneath those layers with her. So how has that really shifted your performance style in, in what you're working to convey differently through these moments? Uh, yeah, I mean, the the she's always been set up as kind of this um, emotional, like the soul of the train. So the emotional soul of the train and someone who who is an empath and can heal other people through kind of hypnosis and all of that good stuff and be be a beacon of hope for everyone or and a place to have a therapist essentially um and uh but she has not done anything for herself so she is taking on everyone else's problems but her own and her problems are facing her head on and what i love about all the song selections and the music choices uh, that they have for her performances specifically is they all kind of echo um mo the moment in time so in season one the open Opening was say it ain't so Joe uh, the loss and the sadness we're all there we're all there together and we're kind of <laughs> sorry we're kind of talking about um, you know the 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 what Wilfred had promised and didn't deliver um, or or what Wilfred had promised and how we're still stuck in this frozen planet and on this train and we never know when we're gonna get off and then um, the second song which was um, that Frank Ocean song which is bad religion that was all about you know um, kind of Wilfred as the god this god this deity that we you know we we put all our hopes and dreams into and, and worship um, and finding out that he wasn't there and the frustrations of how all of this could happen under his name and the inequalities and, you know, just like the, um, the frustration of, of being so loyal and, and loving something so much that doesn't love you back, essentially. It's, the, it's how can this, um, how can Wilfred not love us back? Uh, and then, of course, now in, on, se on season two and episode four, um, it's less about everyone. And it, the song reflects more about what's going on with her. So I sang Glory Box from Portishead. And it's about this abusive relationship that she's kind of forced to um, explore again for the good of the train um and maybe for the good of her own closure but she's done no work at all on herself so is not prepared to face wilford head on and face what he brings out in her and what she brings out in him and their very very dark and lengthy past <laughs> so it's a great um, the pain of the past and the um, the uh, the desire not to fall back into it and the also the helplessness of fe the feeling that you get that she gets when she's faced with her abuser. So that's what it is, and um, it's very complex. <laughs> And I love that you were bringing up the the fact that she is very much an empath and is very much there to help other people process their pain and their trauma while not really processing her own, you know, which has been the case throughout the entire show up until this point with what she's being confronted with at the moment. Um, and how how have you thought about that in a lot of nuanced ways? Because I think you, you beautifully pull that into your performance and what it really takes that she has to give of herself to do that for other people so consistently. Yeah, it it weighs it weighs on you. There's you know there's only so much that you can give if you don't take care of yourself. This is what self care is literally all about. If you do not take care of yourself, you cannot take care of others. And this is this is the purest form of that. She's overextended herself to everyone else but herself. And you know she found a greater cause and found a greater purpose on the train and joined the revolution and. Uh, 
but in being this hero <laughs> or trying to be this hero for everyone, she has uh, she has definitely taken on too much and it's become it and it it's she's she's coming from so now facing Wilford she's coming from a very weakened place um where she does not have it together and uh you can see her spiral very very quickly in episode one two and three uh to where she's getting back into her old habits getting really drunk and trying to deal with deal with Wilford being there um, in any way she knows how, which is substance abuse, and uh, and um, and she doesn't really have anyone to confide in, and she doesn't really have anyone um, who's there for her. She she needs a hug. She needs someone there. She needs someone to look after her, and instead she's asked to do more, and um, and she doesn't know how to ask for help for herself either. So. It is on her as well. <laughs> well, there's also the fact that, you know, she's physically living in a space where she can never escape him, even when he hasn't been there the entire time. You know, there's W's every single place that she looks. And, and there's a lot of moments where you, ca you catch these like great inflections in your eye, just kind of flipping over and processing it and then coming back to the conversation that you're in in the season. And, and even just the fact that her body is a reminder because of the scar that she carries, which, you know, on her arm is a part of her body that she's going to see every single day mm -hmm. consistently. Um, so how have you found different ways to really capture what that does to her emotionally and the fact that she physically can never escape his presence, whether he's there or not in her life? Yeah, it's one of those things like when you've been abused or been in an abusive relationship, it's extremely difficult. It's something you cannot forget. And, um, and it is around with you all the time. And no matter how far you try to run, um, she... I'm lucky because uh, they looked into my past, like my past, Lena Hall's past, and they found that I was a dancer once upon a time when I was younger. And um, them writing that in uh, really helped me convey the um, the the pain and anguish and the the torture. I mean, I, that was the first way I learned how to emote and express myself was through dance and physicality. Um, I'd been a dancer since I was born, essentially. So um, for them to allow me to dance and it be the top and the tail of, of um, episode four, I think it really tells her journey and her struggle and her pain and the reminders, especially um, at the end of uh, the episode four when I'm seated and I'm looking at that W and it's just all there and it, you know, it kind of comes into play. Um, she also, another way that she deals with all of this is um, by what she's wearing and makeup and hair and becoming a different person, um, trying to mask the real person that's on the inside. Um, we got a good look at uh, kind of who she really is towards the end of season one, because she started to bring down the facade. She started to become a little more real um, but she still wears a really tight corset to keep it together, you know, um, she, and also as for her armor, uh, as another way to kind of protect herself. So there are many, many ways that she's express like that she's, um, trying to protect herself and hide, um, what's going on. Uh, and a lot of it is lots of makeup and hair and just anything, but to see who she really is, because I think she, She's embarrassed and um, she doesn't like who she was and uh, she's trying to become someone else. But um, but it's very it's very hard to move on when you're just covering it up. Uh, it's, uh, unfortunately, we, it's much takes a lot more work to <laughs> to move forward from something than to just pile on <laughs> the armor, <laughs> essentially. And then I wanted to talk about some of the specifics of, of the way that you bring forth these musical performances, because 
there's differences to performing on screen and performing musically in theater. You know, in theater, you're having to reach the person who's right at the back of the furthest away seat, you know, high up from you. But at the same time, there's actually also a lot of similarities, you know, when you're performing in a really intimate venue and you can see every single person's eyes as they're close to you. And even in larger venues, you can see everybody at the front. And there's mm -hmm. such an intimate energy connection that really translates to screen. But at the same time, you know, when you're hitting some of those musical notes, having to really think about the minutiae of what your face is doing in a very different way is a totally different experience. <laughs> so what have you found to be those things that have really forced you to think about how you're working differently, but also some of the things that just naturally flowed from one medium in, into the other for you? I think uh, the performance quality of Miss Audrey was helpful because I wasn't just singing a song um, to like tell, tell the story, uh, uh, singing... It is, I am singing this song, but I'm performing. I am on stage. So every time I've sung uh, a, and done a live performance, essentially, on the show, it's been a performative quality, which is really great because this is, that's, where, that's where I'm so comfortable. That's where I live my life, which is in front of an audience. I like being able to see people's faces. I like it when someone's not paying attention. I can grab their attention. You know, it's – to me, that, that makes – everything's so worth it. I love seeing people. It's when you get to the close-ups, in particular, when we were filming the dance number, um, that it was a totally different thing, you know. It was a duet. When we, I was doing that dance, it was a duet between me and the camera guy, like the, you know, the DP. It was a, our duet, and we were dancing together. So, you know, he'd pull away, and I'd come towards him, and we'd go back... And um, and I had to know when they were doing close-ups so I wasn't, like, wildly over the top. <laughs> because, because that is, you know, that is a very, you know, very emotive thing. And so you really get into it. And it's it becomes a facial, a facial uh, you know, a, a over, uh, overly done facial uh, thing. Um, uh, and that also was a much more personal moment, so it needed to be more internal. Um, so, yeah, so it was helpful when they were like, we're doing a close-up now. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Um, and as far as, like, the difference between Broadway uh, theater and um, TV, it – you know, when you're doing a Broadway show, you tell a story from start to finish and you there's no stopping if, you know, unless there's some big technical issue. But, you know, there, there's absolutely no stopping. You tell your story from start to finish and you get to live your character arc eight, eight shows a week when you're on Broadway. So beginning to end and you finish the character and then you put it away and you can say, OK, goodbye um, for the rest of the day or for the rest of the evening until the next show. And with TV and film, you go out of sequence. So it becomes more of a puzzle. Um, and the puzzle pieces uh, sometimes are really hard to fathom because you haven't filmed the previous piece. So you're coming out of a moment and, um, and you don't know what that moment is yet. And you can you see it on paper, but always in a room, it changes. When you're in the room, you're being physical, and you have the costumes and the sets and all everything going on. It is a very different experience than reading something on a page. So it becomes this big puzzle piece. So when you're doing the scene that came before a scene you already did, you have to remember where you were <laughs> emotionally and then try to match that going up. So it's much more cerebral, I would say. Um, Broadway takes less thought in that it's you're on the journey and there's no stopping it. And this one takes a lot of thought to go from there to point D to point C to point Z. You know, it's it's all over the place. Um, so they're they're both the same. It's both the same forms: acting, singing, dancing. But the 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 medium uh, changes things greatly. 
I also love the fact that no matter what the musical performance is, that you always do it live for every single take, every single piece of coverage, um, you know, and uh, the editors have the opportunity to use the pre-record or use the live once they're in post, but that for you, that's always been a really important aspect of the, the character connection. Was that something that the very first moment you knew that those scenes were going to be part of the script, that you had conversations about that being something that was really important to you? I did, yeah. When we did, um, I did an independent feature film called Bex, and um, it was, I had all of these performances in a really loud and noisy bar, and I did pre-records for all the performances to sing along to um, in my in-ears, but when it came to the day of filming, I was, you know, I was like, well, I hope that you can get a really good sound, because I would prefer for it to be the live performance and any, you know, all of the live, because it's just, it makes a huge difference to me in my eyes and my ears when I'm watching something that's sung live as opposed to something that's a pre-record that's, no matter how well it's lip, like lip sync, it, I can always tell, you know, that there's, there's a difference between singing something in a studio and singing something in the moment emotionally when you're there you know it's hard to recreate again and um and so after my experience on Bex um they used all my live vocals and it sounded so good and I I it sounded so good in that it like matched you know my emotions matched what was coming out of my mouth you know it was like it was like a live performance and so I was really begging Snowpiercer to use my live vocals instead of using a track um for season one, they they use the track, the pre-record, but for episode four, you know, the director and the the editors they listened to me and they used my live vocals, and it made such a big difference because there's not a disconnect. You can feel, you know, you can feel what I'm singing. It is right there. It's in your face, and it's it's exactly what's happening live right there. And it makes such a big, big difference. And if you have an artist who can sing live, then use that to your best ability because it'll make such a difference within the scene. And um, and I'm so thrilled that they did that because for me, it, it just, it when you hear a singer live, there's all these, you know, little things, little keys, you know, like little off notes or, or dirt or crack or there's things within it that bring so much color to um, to the performance and so much emotion to a performance that that is what's so important to me. <laughs> and to the point that you were making just before that about open-ended story arcs, I'm actually really fascinated in how that came into play with a lot of the plots that, that we're looking at now in the thread line with Wilford and the point at which you knew that that was such a monumental part of her backstory to be able to start including it in your performance. Or, you know, if when you found out those details, it caused you to pivot anything that you'd constructed for yourself about her previous backstory and history of how she came to be on the train originally. Yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't realize, but like when you come into an episodic, it's it's not all figured out. Like Miss Audrey changed and she adjusted and it actually shows a really cool journey. Um, as I was discovering who Miss Audrey was, like the character started adjusting as well, which I thought was really cool because you can kind of see it on camera. You can hear it too in her in her vocal um, in her, in her, in her just speaking as well. And, uh, when they told me that that indeed was what was going to happen, <laughs> um, and what Wilford and I, that we had a past and, you know, all I was really given, um, uh, before we shot season two, um, was that Wilford and I had a deep past and I wasn't given any, any, ideas of it until probably we started filming episode one of season two. Um, so I didn't get a chance to even know um, in season one what was going to happen. All I knew was that Mr. Wolford was alive in there and that they, I remember, you know, who, who were they going to cast like that? <laughs> that was like it. But there was no talk about like my, you know, my role in, in, in his role in my life. Um, so when you find these things out, you're like, uh oh, you know, did it work out? Is it gonna work? Like, I don't know. And um, and it's worked out really well. I mean, I can I can thread the the lines and and the through, um, and you know, and also uh, 
there's so much that goes on behind the surface. We're not all so forthcoming with our past and our stories and things like that. So, you know, as long as there's complexity in the character, it can be really um, anything. Because I'm not, I personally am not drawing on Miss Audrey's experiences um, for my acting. I'm drawing on my own. And, um, and I think drawing on my own experiences just kind of gives more depth and more complexity to Miss Audrey. Yeah. And there's so many great moments of silence and, and kind of like gameplay and power play and manipulation between the two of them. And even just the very first moment where they lock eyes on each other and there's no dialogue exchanged. And, and so I really wanted to ask about the way in which you know, the two of you constructed a lot of those elements of your performance together and really had conversations about, okay, what is our history? What does this mean? Because we've seen one or two brief flashback scenes, but we know that we're never going to get, you know, a full episode that's going to go deep into absolutely everything that happened. So a lot of it's on the two of you to construct it and play it in this really nuanced way, even in those moments where there's no dialogue explaining it. Yeah. Um, You know, we, we, we didn't talk a ton, actually. Um, what's really cool about working with Sean Bean is um, is that, like, he just knows what he's doing, and he 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 goes for it a thousand percent. So once they call action, it's like a whole different person. It's it's Mr. Wilford. It's not Sean Bean. It's it's a wonderful thing to watch. And as as an actor and as his like co star um, in these scenes. Uh, I am, you know, it, it's it's such a reaction because I don't know what he's gonna do, and I and I and I love that, and I love the spontaneity of what we did together. Um, there were a few things that we had to construct, as in like um, blocking a scene, you know, like the mangoes, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But, and I didn't know how that was going to go, but the, the intensity and just the, he, he locked eyes with me and was so like the chemistry, it was so easy to have with him because he's very open to it. And he was uh, aggressive with it, you know, aggressive with the chemistry. So it was really um, fun and easy. And he made me very, he actually made me very comfortable and at ease to match his intensity, you know, in everything. And, uh, and, um, and our, you know, our, our relationship, it evolves and changes and, and we just had a really fun time, um, working together and, and didn't get too bogged down by the, um, by getting too, um, uh, cerebral with it, overthinking you know, it's kind of like, all right, we know where we were and we know where we are and we know where we're going. So, you know, let's just go with that. <laughs> and, then, and then we give and take. And, and, uh, and it was really, really interesting um, to do that with him. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, feel like, I feel like he's got his own story for the past and I've got my own story you know as actors we'll we'll uh we'll compile our own backstory and everything in our heads and it will be very different than (laughs) the other person and unless it's written on the page or it's important for storyline it actually doesn't matter And, and if you really think about it other people's perceptions like your perception of this interview and my perception of this interview were vastly different so we would tell very different stories and I think that's what makes it so cool is when you've got your own secrets you know backstory that you're working off of and that no one really knows but the complexity of it is there and it shows I do think it's so interesting that they added the detail of the fact that she met him when she was 18 because that's such a formative time in her life and the fact that she spent several years from the, from that age onwards with him and, and being so intimately involved. How did that kind of like age range of, of the time that she spent with him influence the way that you thought about that dynamic and the relationship between the two of them? I, you know, I always imagined that, um, that he had met me much earlier. And um, because if you listen, I say it was a high-end escort 
in Chicago when I was 18, by the time I was 18. So she had been involved in that world much earlier, perhaps as a, perhaps as a trainee or something. <laughs> so um, I, I think that he's got a, a his hold onto her is is very strong. Um, he uh, he's almost a father figure, and you know if if you meet someone at that age and you um, are that are that to them, uh, you, there's there's a different there's a different dynamic than um, than being in a relationship or being lovers, um, because she is so she was so young and so. Um, and 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 so you know naive and and so um, you know uh, easily manipulated. Um, she didn't know any better, uh, and this life to her seemed like the life to lead. And she says, you know, what I made in gold, I paid for. I paid for in other ways uh, that were really bad. And <laughs> so um, so to me, that story goes much further back than 18. And, uh, and um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and with the fact that this is your first series regular role on, on, a, on a show and, and with all of the beautiful complexities you're getting the opportunity to extrapolate in the second season, what do you feel like you've really had the opportunity to learn about yourself as an actor through all of this experience so far? I didn't know I could do it. <laughs> I was so scared. I was so scared when I saw the right, uh, when I saw episode four, I was terrified. Cause I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I've, oh my God. Oh my God, I, I don't know. I've never done anything like this. I've never had to do scenes that were this difficult and, and this hard hitting. And, you know, I, I just wanted to um, honor the the story and, and honor the writing. And I thought I was so blown away by the script that they had written. You know, it was like poetry for me. And, um, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I can deliver. Oh God. And it was the first time I was acting with Sean and like I felt like such a hack. Like <laughs> like holding on for dear life and learning as I went. And uh again, like like performing opposite Sean was so helpful because he let me relax and you know he'll do things and he doesn't care what anyone thinks. It's essentially he, he like turned that part of his brain off. And some of us, like, you're so self-aware, you know, like, oh, where's the camera? Where's it? And he just doesn't, he's just doing that. He's living the life. He's in it. And uh, that actually really helped me a lot uh, to get into that um, mode. But also, like, to do scenes like the scene in the tub. And uh, that was really, really hard. And um, and uh, it, I, I would listen to music. Um, certain songs uh, are are so tragic for me like you know when I hear them it's such a tragic feeling that I get you know and it worked perfectly for the scene um but after we filmed the bathtub scene I honestly you know there's there's now um we now have um intimacy coaches which is great um for sex scenes and things like that uh, which is amazing but I feel like when you do a scene like a suicide scene or uh, something along those lines. I, I couldn't believe how wrecked I was for a long time. And even though it was make-believe, it felt grossly real. And uh, and I wish I had a therapist on hand to talk to afterwards because it was, it was, it was, it took so much, you know, and, and, um, and, and it was scary to do. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, even watching the episode when it aired, um, it was hard to watch because it's it's hard. I, I don't like seeing myself in pain, you know, on camera. It's really hard. And to see that, it was just, like, heart-wrenching. I, I felt ho horrible for Miss Audrey, who <laughs> was myself. Even though I knew it was going to happen, I was so stressed out, you know, <laughs> for her. And, um, you know, I just, you know... It, it, 
it does take a lot out of you. And I, I, I do, you know, to talk to a therapist after doing one of those kind of scenes. I'll, I'll be doing that next time. <laughs> Well, what you've done with this character and, and particularly with that episodes and the, and the ones following is so, so stunning. And I have absolutely no idea what she's doing with him in every single moment, but that's such a testament to the performance that the two of you have put together. Um, so congratulations <laughs> on all of that. And thank you so much, Lena. Yeah, thank you for having me. 